<clears throat> I said though I wanted to talk a little bit about the question that I put in verse in sec section five, question five, about what conclusions does the writer in chapter one discover in his search for wisdom? What are some things that he talks about with regard to the search for wisdom that he draws conclusions about in chapter one? I say chapter one because all of these themes that we talked about on Sunday that are ways in which he searched for the meaning of life and reality is everybody has throughout generations searched for the meaning of life in these same exact ways. Um, all of those things that we mentioned ultimately are repeated a number of different times throughout the book. And so there are multiple approaches that are taken in looking at each of those specific things. And so in chapter one, what are some specific observations he makes about wisdom as he deals with the idea of searching for wisdom as the, as the meaning in life? Why is, why is the search for wisdom vanity of vanities, all is vanity, and like striving after wind? Okay, it's, it is an unhappy business, and then, I, but, but why? I mean, why is it an unhappy business to, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I know there are people that don't really like to learn about stuff, and I've, I'm kind of on the opposite end of that. I've always enjoyed learning new things. Um, so, but, but why does he say that generally speaking, it is an unhappy business um, that God has given us uh, to be busy with these, all these various things that he's going to talk about. Why is it an unhappy business? And again, we know the conclusion, but Greg, go ahead. Uh, Young's literal translation reads that it's a sad travail God has given to the sons of men to be humbled by it. Okay. And so I, I think that gives a little more insight into why this life on this planet is grasping in the wind. It's to, <clears throat> it's to help us understand that we're not in charge of our own lives. And we're not in charge of our own destiny. And we don't control a whole lot of things we think we control. Well, that's right. And it's, I mean, it, and it's, it, it's, it's not going to satisfy. And as Greg said, I, I kind of like that translation of Young's in the sense that it, it gives us an idea of why things are the way that they are when looking at life under the sun. Um, and that shouldn't surprise us back in, I think it's Deuteronomy 8, I think it is, it might be 6. It's either Deuteronomy 6 or Deuteronomy 8. God talks about the fact that he allowed the children of Israel to, to hunger in the wilderness. Why did he do that? To test them so that they might learn on the basis of that, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so he knew what he was going to do in providing for them, but he took them across a difficult area of the land where there wasn't enough food and water to sustain that number of people, uh, knowing that he would provide for them and so that they might learn that they were going to have to be dependent upon him and not upon their own efforts and their own um, abilities. And we need to learn the same lesson. And uh, I, I don't know. I mean, in some ways, maybe it's a, a little bit more difficult in our circumstances to learn the lesson that they learned in wandering through the wilderness because we have so much. And as a result of that, we become, we, we tend to begin to think ourselves self-sufficient, that we, you know, we work really hard, we provide for our needs, we we get all of that stuff together and um, take, take care of our families and all those kinds of things. And so we begin to get this false sense that we are in control. And as Greg said, the truth is, and I think that's part of what he says here in Ecclesiastes 1, these latter verses. Look at verse 12 beginning through the rest of the chapter. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and search out by wisdom all that is done under the sun. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, 
All is vanity and a striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were before me, uh, who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is stri but a striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. <clears throat> and Greg made a point in his comments that I think is in some ways at least alluded to or wrapped up in these latter comments, uh, perhaps in verse 15, but I, I think certainly in verse 18, if, if not both. Um, and that is this, this notion that we have some sort of control over aspects of our life. And the reality is, the wiser you become, the more wisdom that you gain in this life, the more it becomes clear the point that Greg made, which is there are very few things in life that we really truly have any control over whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> that, that makes us sort of uncomfortable, I think. Um, I know people who, ha who, who don't like to fly. And if you really press them on why they don't like to fly, it's because unlike driving a car, they feel like they don't have any control over it. They're at someone else's mercy. Um, and they don't know those people and they don't know what their training is like and all that kind of stuff. And I could tell you horror stories. I will not because I think flying is a great way to travel and it's ultimately extremely safe. Um, so I won't tell you any horror stories. <clears throat> but the, the reality is, I mean, do we have a lot of control even when we drive a car on the road? I mean, what are we at the mercy at when we drive down the street? I mean, start, I mean, start with... Yeah, Samantha said other people. Uh, I mean, are you the only person on the road? How often does that happen? It's rare. Um, and so most of the time, there are lots of other people, especially with most of us who live in the city of Columbus, there are lots of people on the road. <clears throat> you, you think all those people know how to drive? I mean, obviously they have some idea how to, most of them have some idea how to drive. I know there are people on the road that probably don't have any business on the road at all but most of them know how to drive in some sense of that idea but people do all manner of things on the road and we we, we talk about it. you got to watch out for the other guy it's not you you got to be worried about it. you got to watch out for the other guy we tell our children that when they begin to drive um, it's not that I don't trust you you've got to keep your eyes out for what other people are doing because people don't always do what they're supposed to they don't always pay attention like they should and even when they do, sometimes they overlook things that ought to be obvious um, and end up causing accidents. So we don't have any control over other people. That's true in a whole host of aspects of life. What else do we not have control over? Well, there's a, there's a lot of other things. The mechanical aspect of the vehicle. <laughs> That's exactly, that was one of the first things I thought of, uh, Liz. It's, I mean, I, th I think we think, well, okay, okay, I've got the steering wheel and I have the gas and I have the brake. And I have the, the gear shift, and I, so I, I'm, I'm in control of this vehicle. But the reality is, did you build that vehicle? Do you know all the inner workings of that vehicle? And the smarter these cars get, the more of it's being controlled by a computer, um, which is also true of other modes of transportation, by the way, um, and less so by uh, mechanical linkages and controls between aspects of vehicles. and. So the point is, you're at the mercy of, no offense, Andrew, engineers and uh, people who assemble things and all of that kind of stuff. And there are a lot of safety features that are designed and a lot of regulations that regulate those industries. But the reality is that in the, in the end, engineers and people who work, who, who build cars and mechanics and all of those people who have their hands under your hood and under various aspects of your vehicle, what are they all in the end? They're all, I heard it, human. And what happens? People made mistakes, right? Um, and, and not intentionally. It's not that they have bad motives, that they're trying to give you a sabotaged car. I mean, I, I know that happens, but that's not generally the case. Generally speaking, your mechanic's trying to take care of your car. 
Um, it's in his best interest to uh, preserve your longevity and, and in some ways the longevity of your, your vehicle. Um, engineers and people who assemble cars, car companies, they, they're not ultimately wanting to give you a junk piece of machinery because that's not, uh, number one, it's not safe and lends to a lot of lawsuits. And it's, again, not a way to be um, successful for very long. And so they're all trying to give you, but they're all people. And people are involved in every aspect of it. And you had nothing to do with any of it. You didn't design it. You didn't build it. You, in a lot of cases, don't maintain it as far as actually working under the hood and, and those different mechanical aspects to take care of it. Someone else is. And so those aspects you're not, under, you're not in control of. Um, <clears throat> what else? Yes, still talking about driving. Road conditions, hazards, weather. Okay, so so I mean, they, it's across the. Uh, I mean, we're rainy, rainy. It's raining tonight. Um, you may use care. You might slow down that the roads are because the roads are wet. Um, but my my brother a few years ago and his kids never let him live it down. Was on his way back home from work one night drove through an area where few people drove. Um, there had not been any officials in that area that particular night to put up the nice, lovely, flooded roadway signs. And he's driving home and all of a sudden his vehicle comes to a screeching halt in water that was basically up to his neck <clears throat> because the car ran into a flooded area and he had no idea the road was too dark, his lights weren't bright enough for him to be able to see it until he was in it. And uh, I mean, th those kinds of things happen, accidents happen, and it wasn't because he was being careless <coughs> or his car wasn't maintained. It's just, that that's the way it was. So there's all kinds of things, and we could go through any aspect of life, and the reality is we exercise just about as much control in all of them as we do in that one. And that was kind of my point with using that is I think we get behind the wheel. We feel like we're, we're, we're in charge here in a lot of ways, and we're really not. Yes, sir. I think he's, <clears throat> I think I gave a lesson. There was a documented study of if you graphed knowledge and confidence on an on a XY plane, when someone knows nothing, they're not that confident. When they learn a little bit, their confidence spikes. And then when you see even more knowledge, that confidence then plummets the <laughs> because the person, when they learn a little more than what they knew before, <laughs> what you start to learn is the, the scope of what you don't learn. And learning that, I think in verse 18, when he says, with great wisdom comes great frustration. The more you know, the more you realize, I just, I cannot solve all this. I can't figure all this out because of what little I do know. I think you're absolutely right. I do think that's a big point of what he's making here is, if you make it your life's aim to know as much as you can possibly know, you may really hunger for that and really work for that initially, and you, you gain great joy and satisfaction in your early gainings of that knowledge and the information that you're accumulating. But as he said, there comes a point in time when you reach a point where you gain enough wisdom and knowledge to understand there is so much out there I'm never going to be able to attain and understand and know. And that can become a very frustrating thing if you're a lifelong student or somebody whose life is wrapped up in being an intellectual giant and knowing everything they can possibly know because you ultimately come to realize that there are limits to the amount that you can know. And then the second half of that verse, he who increases knowledge increases sorrow, um, it could be that aspect of it. What else? I mean, I think it still goes hand in hand with Greg's point. <clears throat> the, the more things we know, the more things we know we can't know, and the more things we know there's absolutely nothing we can do about. I mean, there's nothing we can control in those things. And it's, that, that can be a scary thing. And, and I think sometimes if we're not careful, we get bogged down in at least some aspect of that mentality that the world has a problem with. Uh, I, I fear in some instances that Christians fall into the same trap as the world, uh, the, the uh, American world. Every four years when we get ready to elect a president, we allow it to get us anxious 
and concerned about where the direction of the country is going to go and what that's going to mean for me and my family. Um, and, and I'm not saying there shouldn't be consideration given to all those things and um, <clears throat> you know, taking a role in that if that's what you want to do and be involved in in some way. But ultimately, is my life wrapped up in whether or not my candidate wins the presidency? It better not be, um, because in the grand scheme of the great world that we live in, and, and especially in the eternity we look forward to, how much control does the President of the United States really have over all that? Not very much, and a lot less than he thinks he does, um, even in this country itself. Um, and I'm not talking about in the political realm and the government and the way everything's set up. I'm talking about the fact that we, ser we serve, ultimately, whether they recognize it or not, a creator God who is, continues to be sovereign over his creation <clears throat> and, and can do with, with this country, as he has done with nations in the past, at whatever time and for whatever purpose he sees fit. And so I'm a lot less worried about who's sitting in the presidency and in the White House than I am and whether or not I'm right with the Creator. Um, and, and that's where our concern needs to lie. And again, the, the difficult balance in all of this, and it's really the whole point, a lot of the point of this book, the difficult balance becomes, where do we live right now? I mean, this is easy. It's not, I mean, I'm not being specific. I mean, it's, we all live on the earth. Or, or, to use the term of Ecclesiastes, we are under the sun. We all live here. Are there responsibilities that are involved with living here? Are there anxieties and worries and cares that go with living here? Yes, and, and those are, those are, there's nothing wrong with those on the surface. The problem becomes when they require so much of our attention and focus that we lose focus on what the reality is, which is where is our citizenship? Our citizenship is in heaven. Um, we are pilgrims and sojourners here. Now, again, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob understood that concept of sojourner a lot better than we do because they really were. I mean, the only plot of land that Abraham ever owned was a, a plot for burying his family. And so they, they understood sojourner. I mean, we all have property that we live in. Some of us have multiple properties that we own. <clears throat> but the reality is we are pilgrims here. This life is temporary and our citizenship is in heaven. And that's where we have to keep our focus. And thanks be to God that because of our relationship with God in Christ, we're on the side of the one who's going to win and the one who will help us no matter what happens to this country or who's in the presidency or any of the other number of things that we can pull out that are hot button issues and topics that people of the world concern themselves with deeply. And if we're not careful, we get sucked into those traps and we have to be careful of that. We have to just remember that while those things may have some bearing on life here under the sun, <coughs> it is not the end all of who I am and what I look forward to, and the blessings that God can provide for me and for mine. Joy. I couldn't help but think uh, in our discussion and also in the reading that one of the successful elements of addiction training is knowing and repeating uh, there are things I cannot change and I need to accept that. Right. Apart, so that it's not just a, a routine thing, but um, things that I cannot ch change, and I want to, I need to accept them. And so, what's my list of things that I can't change? Other people, circumstances, right. and then the things that I can, which and it says, give me the courage, or grant me the courage. Well, right. that means it has to apply to the things that's in me that right. I can change. So, the the wisdom of it is knowing the difference. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, it really is. And, and, and that's, that ultimately should be the wisdom that we seek from God is the wisdom to be able to recognize the difference between what we can change and what we can't. And then the strength to be able to accept the things that we can't and to leave those ultimately in his hand and in his care um, is an important aspect of all of this. So, <coughs> okay, there'll be more to be said about wisdom actually even in chapter 2. But uh, those were a couple of the points I wanted us to talk about in chapter 1 before we moved on. And as I told you, it might be 15 or 20 minutes, even though I said it was only going to be the first part of class. Um, I guess that qualifies as basically half the class or a little more. Anyway, anything else about chapter 1? If you've got other things that you think of later with regard to chapter 1, good news for you is these topics we've dealt with in the first chapter are going to be repeated again in other chapters. So we can talk about those things at that particular point in time as well. I'm not, I'm not married to just talking about the, the immediate stuff at hand um, if it applies to the overall message of what we're talking about. Okay, so in chapter 2, he moves forward to a couple of other aspects of things that we talked about that are various things that people have used in an effort to search out the meaning of life. And the writer himself also tried those things, uh, gave those things a, a try just to see if those things would satisfy and fulfill. Um, what are they? There's a couple of them, I think, in this chapter. And then, like I said, wisdom near the end of the chapter gets brought up again. <coughs> but uh, first part of the chapter... I guess it's actually the middle of the chapter that wisdom comes back in again. But anyway. It's a little hard because this first section of chapter 2 from verse 1 through about verse 11 kind of goes over two of these things and it almost kind of bounces back and forth so it becomes in some ways difficult to know which one he's talking about at which time. And so I asked him a couple of questions. Is this different than what he was asking here? And <clears throat> that's up to you as to how you see that. But in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, what are a couple of the, the, the new ways that are brought up in this, book, this chapter that are ways that he searched out the meaning of life? <clears throat> Pleasure. Pleasure. And pleasure can find its um, fulfillment in a number of different ways. What are a couple of ways that he mentions in this text that he tried it? One of them is really explicit because he says, I did this in order to seek out pleasure. Um, the other one might be found more subtly, and you might have actually lumped even more things than just a couple of them in with the idea of pleasure because... That's the thing about these two things that we're talking about today um, in chapter 2. They, they, in some ways, go hand in hand and kind of overlap at times, um, or, or at least could. So how, what, what ways did he attempt to satisfy his life with pleasure? The specific one he mentions at the very beginning of chapter 2 is what? He used wine. <clears throat> so the idea of some, some form of um, drug, wine, other drugs I would think would fit into the same concept as what he's talking about here, but he sought pleasure through the use of substances, um, to put it in a <clears throat> terminology that we would use more commonly perhaps today. Yes, sir. They have an eye problem? Yeah. There's no doubt about that. I mean... I counted 33 times there. He said, I, 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 I did this and that. Yeah, he, there's no doubt about the fact that he had an eye problem. And I mean, I think that would be true of the, the pronoun I, but also true of the EYE, physical organ I. Um, he had a problem with both of those. But... Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, there were, the, the aspects of things that he's talking about throughout this book of life under the sun very much are ultimately problems with self. And that's true whether it's Solomon or anybody else who indulges their flesh in these things. 
Um, because uh, if, if yourself is what is the focus and you're seeking after what you want, um, either to possess or to enjoy or to build or whatever it is, then generally speaking, at, at some point it doesn't matter so much what the consequences of that are for other people um, as long as you get what's going to satisfy you. And we've, we've lived in an age, uh, and I'm so old now that I will date myself, but <clears throat> it used to, <clears throat> McDonald's would say, that was, was uh, termed my McDonald's. I think that's been gone for a couple decades now, or at least 15 years. Uh, Burger King's motto for forever when I was growing up was have it your way. Um, and the idea was, I mean, it, however you want your burger, we'll make it that way. And I, I can't remember, I heard the other day how many thousands, I think, of combinations exist on the Whopper alone. Um, so you can have your Whopper however you like your Whopper because it's your Whopper and you can, and you know what, for a burger, that's fine. If that's what, I mean, you, you, you have, you, you, you shouldn't feel guilty about wanting your Whopper your way. And Burger King will make it that way for you. The problem is people have taken that mentality of have it your way to mean that whatever gives me pleasure, whatever brings me joy, whatever makes me happy, I should be able to do that. Um, uh, singers have written songs about it. Movies have been made about it. People have tried that in every sense that they could think of. If it makes me feel good, if it gives me enjoyment, if it, if it brings me happiness, then I should be able to do it because, and so, sometimes I've even heard Christians who will say things that are outside the scope of what God would want them to do and it's clear from what he said in his word and their answer is God would want me to be happy. Really, that's God's focus is your happiness. No matter the cost, I mean, whatever brings you joy <coughs> and People have tried that, and, and pleasure is one of the ways that people will try that. Substances, what other ways are there to experience pleasure? And this is where kind of wrapping in some of these other ideas in this text may still fit that concept. What, what, oh, I mean, let's do this. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, what is the second way that, he, that, that, that we could distinguish from pleasure that is a way that he sought, ple uh, sought to find fulfillment and satisfaction. Possessions. Possessions. And the reason why I've said these two may kind of blend together and overlap is the ability to have wealth and buy things allows us to buy things that bring us what? To bring us pleasure. I mean, pe some people want to accumulate things just for the sake of accumulating them. The, the pleasure that they find is in the abundance of their possessions and in the fact that they can compare themselves with the other people who are around them and say, I've got more than you have. Or you've got this, but I've got this and it's better. And so it's not necessarily so much about the joy that it brings them. The joy that they get is from having it, just from the fact that they possess it. Um, but the, re the, the truth is the reason these can kind of blend together is because there are things that you can buy that bring you pleasure. Uh, he mentions gardens, and while we might think of those as being more of a possession or something you create or build, um, uh, the work of your hands, some people enjoy the aesthetic beauty of a garden. And so it is about the pleasure, that the, the eye pleasure that it brings them to be able to look out and to enjoy that. And so... <clears throat> pleasure and possessions can blend together. Can you have pleasure without possessions? Yes. Um, <clears throat> can you have possessions without pleasure? We've already kind of talked about that. There are people, I do believe there are people who just accumulate stuff for the sake of accumulating stuff. It's all about who has the most toys. And so they, they don't, they, it's not really necessarily that they plan on using any of it, they work themselves to death so that they can accumulate all this stuff so that they can say, I'm better than you are, or I look better than you are because I have more things than you do or the things that I have are better than the things that you have. And so it's just about the accumulation of stuff. So you can have one without the other, but frequently what happens is it is the blending or intermingling of both of those two.
two things. Um, and so I, I brought that up because I, I think a lot of these other things that are listed, while maybe thought of more as possessions, could also be seen as that which brought him pleasure. He had the wealth to buy it and to build it and to, to uh, have others build it, but the reality is that he did that not necessarily for the sake of accumulating all of those things so much as for the enjoyment that it brought him to, uh, to, to, to look at them and to use, utilize those things. This man was... Right. He was like, ooh, I like music. Let's hire people. All of these things that uh, he built his dream house is. Right. How often do we think about, oh, if I could only build a house, this is exactly how I'd lay it out. Which, obviously, there's wonderful things about, like, personal property and owning things on this earth. Absolutely. And sometimes I read this chapter and, and we see how he, he just pleasured himself with everything he could think of. But that wasn't easy. No. He didn't just lay down no. and let things happen to him. And we have to remember that sometimes we can be working so hard. We can be trying so hard to achieve the next thing, the next goal, the next job, the next um, toy, the next house, the next addition, the next car, whatever. But eventually he talks about how there's no profit under the sun. Right. It's, it's no profit from the perspective of ultimately those things don't satisfy. So there's that aspect of it. And then he goes even further talking about toil and possessions and all of that stuff in the latter part of this chapter by saying what, what ultimately is true of all that stuff. You know, I said earlier, some people just want the most toys. What, did you, what was it, Audra? Like striving after the wind. It's like striving after the wind. One of the reasons is because it doesn't fulfill. It's not satisfying. We'll talk about that more in chapter 5 because it gives a few more reasons why it doesn't satisfy. But in, in the end of chapter 2, all of those possessions and all of that work and all of that stuff doesn't satisfy. It, it, it doesn't really deal with that aspect. What's the part that it deals with in the latter part of the chapter in verses 18 through the end? Where, where it talks about the fact that you pass away and somebody else gets it. That's right. You, you know, there, I, I've joked before, and again, it dates me. There used to be a bumper sticker that says, he who dies with the most toys wins. And some smart person decided to have one that says, he who dies with the most to toys still dies. Um, and, you know, regardless of what the pharaohs thought, what happens when you die to all of your stuff? You can be buried with it all you want to. Where does it stay? Here. It stays here on the earth, under the sun. I mean, that's the reality. You leave all of it behind. Most of us are not so fortunate as to be able to build a pyramid and store all of our stuff with us there. Um, and there would really be no point anyway. But So what happens to all of our stuff when we die? <laughs> it stays here, but... Specifically, goes to our kids or somebody else. And he, he, he deals with, in the latter part of this chapter, when he goes to someone else. I mean, we generally speaking, most of us in this building, don't feel any kind of remorse or regret that our children are going to get our things when we pass on and get to use those things. But he deals with another aspect of that, and that is that stuff gets left behind. And sometimes what's true of the people it gets left behind to? This does happen with children or grandchildren or other relatives. Um, hopefully it doesn't happen to us, but it can. Huh? It's all wasted. It goes to somebody 
who didn't work for it and doesn't respect it and doesn't utilize it for good purposes and it gets wasted. How much control of that do you have? I mean, I guess you could write your will really specifically um, <clears throat> to show everybody how much you really care about all your stuff. But the point is of this chapter is it's futile to, to make it the aim of your life. Um, later, as I said in chapter 5, we'll talk about some specific reasons why it's futile in this life. Uh, he might even allude to it a little bit in this chapter. But then the other reason is because you accumulate all that stuff. And if all you do is spend all of your life accumulating stuff and enjoying these pleasures that come from all your stuff, in the end... No matter how rich you are, you die and you leave all that stuff behind to people who aren't, not, aren't necessarily going to care about it or enjoy it um, or do anything good with it. And that this too is vanity and like striving after the wind. And you have zero to do about that <clears throat> when it's all said and done. Um, anything else about pleasure or possessions in this chapter? Don't jump ahead on me yet. Go ahead. I don't know if this is specifically to this. <laughs> Oh, you're right. it, for some reason, it just makes clear the character of the author here because how many people in their life, if they lived a life like this, would at the end of it say, it's not worth it? <laughs> or say, or, or like have all these pleasures and say, it doesn't fulfill what I wanted. There's so many people in this world who have anything they ever want and they would never look back on it. They go to their grave and think that it's, yeah. it's this, is, this is what I should have been doing. Uh, um, and so, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I do. And I, again, it, gives me great hope that maybe this is Solomon's yeah. uh, swan song. Yes, sir. Well, couple, Don't know that, but... So, uh, so the point that Zach made, a couple of things that the writer says, when he's talking about uh, in verse 3, he says, all the while my mind was guided with wisdom. And then later on, when he talks about all the possessions, um, I don't know how the other translate, translations put it. I was looking at one that uh, the NET Bible, I don't so I was far wealthier than all my predecessors, yet I maintained my objectivity, is the way it renders that. And I just, I was curious, like, what, what does that look like? That he's doing all this stuff, but he's saying, but I, I stayed wise, but I stayed objective for all of it. And we would think, well, if you're indulging like crazy in all this stuff, and you're just going all out with the wealth and the, and the pleasure, like, how could you say that you're maintaining wisdom or you're staying objective? I mean, I don't know what, what kind of a nerd this guy was. Was he, was, was he keeping charts and Able to balance that stuff. about it while he was doing it? In a way, I can relate. Well, yeah. And I mean, you know, it makes you wonder, does he necessarily mean in all of it? Or, you know, is that maybe a little too loose a translation? And what he means is there were times, because he clearly talks about the fact that um, he tried wisdom and he also tried what? He tried fool. He tried folly. He tried being, being a fool. Um, living without wisdom. And so he, he did some of those things too. And so the question becomes, were there times when he just indulged himself in the pleasures and didn't really give it a whole lot of consideration? And then other times where he was really meticulous and thoughtful and planning ahead about the way that he was going to do all of those kinds of things. And so kept a more objective approach in that instead of just going with the flow and doing whatever. And, and uh, the answer is, I don't know. <clears throat> but... The reality is because of who he was, he had the opportunity to try all of these things to a fuller extent that I at least ever will be able to. Um, and so he explains to us on the basis of his experience um, what he experienced in that. And I, I, I appreciate that approach because it allows us to look at it and to see he's tried all of that. Um, now, the, the, the problem is, because we try to do this with our children, don't we? We try to teach them on the basis of the mistakes that we made so that we try to help them m avoid the same mistakes. How well does that frequently work out? How, how, uh, how often do our children look at the mistakes that we've made on the basis of our experience and knowledge decide to do it all the way that we in, instruct and try to help them to do it. Oh, uh, pretty much never. And, and frequently they learn the same lessons we learned. How do they learn them? The hard way, through experience. And, you know, but the point is, can they plead ignorance? 
And, and I guess the other question is, why do we do that? Because the, our children are not the only ones, by the way. Adults do the same thing. We observe these things, and that's really the point of this book for Ecclesiastes is, here is Solomon. You think Solomon didn't really get to try uh, making life all about possessions or pleasure? You think there was anything he really didn't have the opportunity to try? And he found out it was vanity. So we should just all trust him, right? And keep our focus where it needs to be and not make this the aim of our life and we'll all be happier for it. But how many of us make some of the same stupid mistakes he made? And the same thing with Israel. We're so quick to be critical of them. And then we, we do exactly the same kinds of things. So, you know, we talk about our kids not learning from us. And we do the same thing with all the biblical examples that we have. And so, <clears throat> it's people. People are people. And we will keep doing the same things we've always been doing. Because we are stubborn and... Uh, um, overbearing and think we know what we're doing and all of that stuff and uh, we're a lot less smart than we give ourselves uh, credit for so okay I'm going to stop because it's time past time <laughs>